So Inherent Vice, which is the new movie by <coughs> Paul Thomas Anderson, of whom I'm a huge and lifelong fan, adapted from a novel by Thomas Pynchon, who famously is a novelist who doesn't like the word reclusive, as he says he's not reclusive. He just doesn't like having his photograph taken. He doesn't like having a public profile. And um, so this is uh, an adaptation of his 2009 novel, which is set in California, Los Angeles, in uh, 1970, the early part of 1970. It's very specific um, about its time period. And essentially, it's a kind of stoner mystery story that falls somewhere between The Big Sleep and The Big Lebowski with the kind of the, the ghost of Robert Altman's uh, long goodbye hovering over everything. There is a plot which is <coughs> deliberately incomprehensible, but essentially... The plot follows this um, sort of pot-smoking PI, Larry Dox Portello, played by Joaquin Phoenix, with these uh, Neil Young sideburns. I mean, actually, an awful lot of the way he looks is modelled on Neil Young, you know, after the Gold Rush Harvest period. And um, at the beginning, he is... Vis- Harvest. That's a good song. Can yeah. We, should we put it on our playlist? Yeah, sure. Because yeah. you're a Neil Young convert. I am. Now. I'm now. I'm totally sold on Neil Young. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so at the beginning, he's uh, he visited uh, briefly by uh, ex-girlfriend uh, Shastafe Hepworth, and she essentially sets in motion what can only be described as an absurdist chain of events. The whole film is broadly comedic, but also perhaps more importantly, profoundly melancholic. Um, when I interviewed Paul Thomas Anderson a while ago, he described it as this aching, sweet dripping, you know, longing for the past. And I think you get some of that in this clip. Psst. Is that you, Shasta? Thinks he's hallucinating. No, just a uh, new package, I guess. I need your help, Doc. Uh, you know, I have a an office now. That's like a day job and everything. I looked in the phone book. I almost went over there. Then I thought better for everyone if this looks like a secret rendezvous. So, somebody keeping a close eye? Just spent an hour on surface streets trying to make it look good. So basically, there is then, as I said, a totally incomprehensible story in which he goes off looking for a missing person and essentially we're led into this world of sort of Nixonian vice and police brutality and missing persons and Chinatowny land deals and druggy dentists and undead musicians and international smuggling rings and freaked out cops and, and the whole thing has the air of something which is, you know, like in an altered state. It's very much a movie that you feel that Paul Thomas Anderson wants you to to inhale rather than to watch. He's talked uh, in interviews when people have complained that they can't follow the plot. He said, no, well, you're not really meant to. You're just oh, meant to great. sort of bob. No, but but like, there is, you know, that's an argument that actually what's meant to happen is that the atmosphere of it is meant to engulf you and you just kind of succumb to these strange paranoid rhythms of it, which are interrupted all the way through by the fact that it's a comedy and it has this kind of Zucker Brothers, um, you know, slapstick zaniness to it. I mean, literally pratfalling zaniness. There's a character played by Josh Brolin called uh, Bigfoot Bjornsson, who's this... um, this kind of LAPD cop where his suit is sort of slightly too tight he's got this flat top and he's you know he did one muto panakeko muto panakeko hi hi and he, all that stuff which is in the trailer actually the trailer makes it look like an out and out slapstick comedy I mean the trailer has got just you know comic moments the film itself is m- much more sort of multi-textual than that and actually the primary sense you get out of the film at the end is of this very richly textured world, not least because it's shot by Robert Elswit, who shot it on 35mm stock, and it looks beautiful. The period detail is extraordinary. It's had two Oscar nominations, one for its screenplay. I mean, Anderson sort of pretty much lifted entire sections of Pynchon's dialogue just straight out of the novel and put them into the screenplay. And the other one is for costume design. And, you know, the costumes are extraordinary. There are the nods, obviously, to Neil Young, and this is the famous thing about Owen Wilson being Zoot from The Muppets and... uh, Rudy Blatnoid, the dentist, who basically looks like Austin Powers. And you get this, that sort of sense that, wow, doing, the, doing the, that wardrobe stuff must have been a, a riot. The question, therefore, is what about the rest of the film? Because when the film opened in America, there were all these stories about, yeah, there was this kind of chaos on set and, you know, had this kind of chaotic feeling and the whole film has this sort of trippy, stony, you know, hallucinogenic sense to it. And I've always had that rule that the more fun a film was to make, the less fun it is to watch. 
And I think, firstly, it's wrong to imagine that the film is in sort of free fall, free fullness. I think actually it's better organised than perhaps people think. I think what the, what Anderson has attempted to do is to take the unfilmability of Pinch and Source and put it on screen in a way which doesn't simply simplify it. However, that said, there are moments in the film when you find yourself completely in step with it, in which it's sort of asking you to, uh, you know, to, to, to laugh hysterically at some of the jokes, but also to feel that kind of creeping paranoia, that very Hunter Thompson, post-Altamont, Manson generation, you know, Kent State shootings, all that stuff is going on in the background. You know, you, it's that it's that that feeling of paranoid fear behind it. But there are moments, and the film is the best part of two and a half hours long, when you start to fall out of step with it, and when that happens, you suddenly feel like the only so sober person in a room full of furry freaks. And it, and the, all the way through the film, it walks a tightrope between, between those two things. So for me, for all the things I love about it, Johnny Greenwood's beautiful score, which adds this sense of melodrama and romance and sort of creeping around the edges of these, you know, Neil Young tracks and, and can and that sort of thing, that incredibly tactile cinematography which really feels like you've got your hands in the in the soil of the of 1970 i mean it's you know to for, for a few sequences they were using old heat damaged stock particularly to get that old feeling but actually it's the rest of the stuff it's, it's created artificially but it's done very well a couple of sort of very committed performances but it's not my favorite anderson film and the reason is because it shares the mania of Punch Drunk Love, which is about 95, you know, 98 minutes long. And in Punch Drunk Love, which is actually comparable in as much as it's sort of basically a comedy with a character in it who is fundamentally unhinged, that's all reined in by this very tight structure, by the fact that the film is brief and, you know, cuts to the chase and has almost no fat on it at all. I do think that Inherent Vice is baggy. I do think there are, and I know for a fact, <coughs> excuse me, I know for a fact that there are people who have lost patience with it and found it intolerable. There is much in there that I love, much in there that I'm really seduced by, and much in there that I kind of feel it's such a brilliant evocation of that period. But I have to confess, there is also stuff in it in which it's, okay, I've suddenly stepped out of the, the flow of the film, and suddenly I feel like the sober guy in a room full of drunks.